Hey, we're live. Hey, welcome to Tile Coach. I'm Isaac Ostrom. Thanks for being with me today. It's been a little while since I've been live, so happy to be here and we'll let people kind of fill in here. But I uh, received an email, kind of the inspiration behind this live stream today was I, I got an email today from uh, Jared Hendricks um, with Masterworks Restoration and Remodel. And uh, he said, good morning. And man, I just want to say thank you for creating these videos and sharing your journey with us. I've learned so much from you and can't thank you enough. You are welcome. Uh, promote, He says, I promote your videos almost daily. Uh, thank you very much for sharing my videos. I'm a carpenter of 23 years and have found myself transitioning into more of the tile industry in the past year and truly enjoy it because of your tips and techniques. My main reason for reaching out today is not only to thank you, but to ask for advice on how to effectively bid projects. I'm located in the ever booming Boise, Idaho area, actually about 45 minutes north of Boise, and see that I, I am underbidding projects. I am considered one of the best carpenters in my area and take a lot of pride in my work, but don't want to do it for free practically. Any advice or direction would be greatly appreciated. I will be buying some of those t-shirts and swag soon, my friend. Thank you very much, uh, Jared, uh, for not only sharing my videos, sending me an email, but uh, buying some merchandise. Uh, so instead of uh, replying to his email, I thought, hey, I'll make a live stream because it seems to be a topic a lot of you guys have uh, been asking me about. So I've done some general business stuff. I kind of like to talk about that. But... Uh, not specifically estimating and how I do my estimates. Um, so I just want to make sure you guys can hear me all right. Everything is good. Um, please may leave a comment there on the side. Let me know that uh, you can see and hear me well. I'm um, just doing this for my office on my um, MacBook Pro here. So, um, so yeah, so the estimating. Um, so if you saw the video thumbnail, okay, perfect. Thumbs up. Glad you can hear me. Glad to see you all. Um, so um, here's a typical estimate from my company. Um, I got uh, do this through QuickBooks. Uh, QuickBooks is a good program for the most part. Actually, my QuickBooks crashed ironically today, and my last backup <laughs> was two weeks ago. So I've been... Uh, fumbling around with that and getting that all worked out, but I'm, I'm getting it figured out. Um, so, but QuickBooks has been great for me. Um, it's good. I know they have an online version. I use the desktop version. It, it uh, is a good way for not only estimating and invoicing, but the bookkeeping aspect as well. And even if you're just a do it yourself or, uh, you know, one man show, one man crew, I still ran my QuickBooks. I run everything through QuickBooks now. I even do my payroll through QuickBooks and I handle that all myself. I do have a bookkeeper who helps enter bills. My wife helps with that. But all of the estimating I do, I don't, um, even though I have, uh, we have, I have four installers in the crew. I, I've thought about bringing in somebody to help estimate and project manage. Um, I still, I think um, just part, I like, the control of setting my pricing. And so I, I just do all the estimates still. So, um, yeah. Hey, I see that, uh, Zach Perry tile money podcast and Facebook group made me raise my prices and know my own worth. Hey, that's a great comment. Uh, Luke with tile money. He's, he's great. I've met up with him. He's actually come by my showroom here and we had uh, a great chat. I've done a podcast with him, his podcast, and his YouTube is uh, just, he's got so much information on there about uh, business practices in general, how to be profitable with your business, uh, how to structure your business. But I'm just going to talk from my own experience here and how I did it, which was no formal training or really, I never read books on it. I just knew QuickBooks work. So I grabbed it. You know, it's really simple to type up a quote turn it into an invoice and go from there. So, but the basics, I, I, I see a couple different ways uh, to estimate a project. Okay. You can either have an hourly rate or a daily rate and just figure it out that way. Um, create your, your, um, your line item in a lump sum say. Um, so for example, with this one here, 
I have the master bath. Um, I have um, what I'm basically doing that I'm tiling over a hot mop. Uh, and then I have the guest bath and notice how I don't separate these out and I don't put a line item for each one that I do down here. I've created one lump sum for both of the bathrooms, which is what, uh, 15,000 and change for, for those two bathrooms, the tile work. So, um, that's a good way to do it. If you just want to do a lump sum, you can create your daily rate or your hourly rate, figure it out, put it in one lump sum. Uh, that's a good way to do it. That's why that's probably the way I do most of my estimates. The other way to do it is you see, I have some line items on here, which were add ons. So, um, he wanted to add a heated floor. He wanted to add in a herringbone pattern. He wanted to change from a porcelain to a marble. So I put some line items and actually did square footage quantities. Um, so for the heated floor, I have a, I have a square footage rate of $25 and that's including the material, right? So say you have a hundred square feet of floor, you want to heat it, um, $25 times hundred, that's going to be a $2,500 upcharge to heat, um, the floor that's material that's install labor. So I don't have that broken down between labor and install. It's just a square footage. Uh, the other ones are, uh, material up charges. So I've just added um, to my allowance because up here I have allowances. And so down here, I just added since the marble was, uh, I think, $11.90 $11 more um, than the $6 allowance. So I added that multiplied by a quantity, really easy, transparent to see. Um, the last thing I, and another thing I did um, to add on the herringbone pattern, I charged a $15 a square foot up charge for the herringbone uh, with a border. It's not just herringbone, but it's with a border. So I, I do it both ways. Um, you can do square footages. Um, if you're going to do square footages, uh, I just um, make sure I kind of reverse engineer it, right? So I, I, I take, you know... When, when I proposed this original estimate, right, it didn't have the options in the add-on. So he had already approved the the general, the, the 15,670, he'd approved it. So I was thinking, well, how do I do present these add-ons um, without him thinking, oh, I'm just coming up with some arbitrary number, maybe trying to overcharge him. I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and do square footage pricing because it actually looks like I think when you do a square footage price, I think it makes you look more professional, like you have a formula and that that formula goes, you know, for everybody. I think it, when you present somebody, when they ask you for a square footage install price, I think they can assume that's the going rate. That's your going rate. I'm not price gouging um, or anything, but whether you do it that way or not, I usually reverse engineer it. So I, to do, you know, the heated floor, I go, well, it's going to be 2,500 bucks. You know, maybe it's uh, 1,500 in material, 1,000 in labor um, add on to do that. So I go, well, you know, just divide by the square footage. $25 a square foot is what I get. But presenting it instead of 2,500 upcharge saying, you know, $25 a square foot, uh, I think that for me anyways, when I present it that way, I feel a little more confident doing that. And when you're estimating and presenting these things, confidence and sales in general is huge. If you have the confidence in your pricing and you state it with confidence, if you're kind of like, uh, well, it's going to be about, you know, and you're kind of, you know, <laughs> you're not confident, uh, the, the other person's going to pick up on that. So, that's that's kind of the the two different ways that I see of doing it a lump sum daily or hourly rate or doing square footage pricing. So the thing with my company which may be a little different than yours is that we do uh, full bathroom remodels. So we're not just doing tile. Tile I think is a little easier to do square footage pricing. Uh, for us when we're we're counting in uh, tile work. We're also counting in demo, plumbing, drywall, painting, cabinets, countertops sometimes. Um, 
I want to have a lump sum because it's not real easy to shop. You know, it's just like, okay, this is my price. I explain as what I'm, I'm doing in there, but that's going to be uh, a lump sum. But if you're just doing tile work, and so one of my good friends, Ron with Artisan Tile here in Sacramento, they do track homes. So all of his pricing is square footage, lineal footage, piece pricing. And they do, I mean, he's doing, um, you know, he's got like 20 guys on his crew and they're just doing new production work here in the Sacramento area. And so I'll ask him his pricing. And so he'll always have square footage pricing. He always has a square footage. And he tells me, he goes, I just want to take the emotion and the thought out of it. I don't want to, um, you know, it is what it is. You know, these are my prices. This is the way I do it. Um, but he has to, he still has to reverse engineer stuff, right? Because he's got to figure out, okay, well, if the customer adds on a herringbone, there's no real set uh, price for that until you do it. And so he just figures how much longer it will take, right? And so then he, he'll he go ahead and he'll add those in. But here's the thing, when we were doing when we were doing, um, you know, back in like the, the, the 2000s, the, the aughts, I think they call them, you know, 2006, 2007, square footage pricing was everything. You could go into Home Depot, right? And, you know, they'd have it right there for customers who wanted to get install, you know, $4.95 a square foot tile install. And that was like across the board, right? Like $5 a foot was the going rate. Uh, so, but things were so much different there because it was like, you know, we had 12 inch tiles, 12 by 12s. We had 18 by 18s. You had big, thick three sixteenths inch joints. Hey, if, if you remember those days, Hey, give me a thumbs up. You remember those were the good old days. And we would blow out like five or 600 feet in a day per setter, you know, make really good money. But things have changed as you know, quite a bit. Tiles have gotten bigger, grout joints have gotten smaller. So the square footage, changes based on the tile itself the the and so and the the flatness of the substrate what what we're going to be doing with that so it's like it's it's real it's different so if you're going to come up with square footage pricing i would definitely recommend uh doing some reverse engineering knowing what you need to make during a day uh, and then realistically figuring out, like realistically, be honest about it, what you know you're going to be able to get done in a day. And also figure in, you know, the downtime. If you're running your own business, there's going to be things that you got to deal with, whether it's customer service repairs from other jobs or, you know, you're going to your, your day is going to get broken up a little bit. It's easier for us to think like, oh, I know I can lay this this many feet in a day. But. Oftentimes we run into hiccups that's either from, you know, either office work or, you know, somebody calls you and you got to spend some time talking to them on the phone or whatever. You eat lunch, you get gas. I mean, there's things that, that you have to do. And so make sure you're really honest about how much you're going to be getting in, done during the day before you reverse engineer and come up with those square footage or lineal footage prices. So it's, um, I would also, so the way my buddy Ron does it too. So if he's doing a shower, you know, he goes, um, you know, say, say he, you know, we, we float our showers here in production work. So he says, you know, floated shower walls, I'm 25 bucks a foot. And then he goes, and then, um, you know, the trim, we're either doing Schluter trim or we're, um, you know, cutting down a bull nose, making a cap or however you're trimming it. Okay. Now I'm, I'm adding $5 a lineal foot for that. Okay. And a window wrap. Okay. We, we got to charge for the window and then we got to charge for the niche. And then we got an upcharge if they have a mosaic inlay. So you really need to figure out um, what those prices are, but if you can figure those out and you can present them in an estimate in square footage, lineal footages, pieces, items, to a customer, I believe it's a much more solid estimate because you have a formula. And I think one thing that makes customers kind of uh, unsure or not even unsure, I think they just, um, they don't want to be taken advantage of, right? They don't want to be, feel like, especially in this time when it's really busy 
and there's a ton of demand and not as much supply for installers. So our prices go up, which is which is great. But they don't want to feel like um, just because we're busy that we're going to up our prices just for them. And so if you have a set square footage, lineal footage item pricing, I think that goes that makes the customer feel a lot better because they're like, okay, this is his pricing across the board and uh, makes them feel a lot more confident. So that's basically, I have those, those two basic ways. I saw a, um, I saw a comment on here from somebody, I mean, it already went by about time of materials. Um, time of materials is, you know, I, I don't operate that way very often. I actually don't like to give hourly rates out I just don't, you know, I don't know what it is. I, I get, I've, I've gotten a lot of kind of odd vibes from giving somebody an hourly pricing because I, I don't think people really understand exactly what goes into it. Um, when you present it up front, obviously they're going to be able to calculate it afterwards or if you give them a time you say well it's going to take us about a week and i'm charging you xyz they're going to figure out how much you're making about an hour but when you present it and you tell them well i want to make 100 125 bucks an hour you know where their, their mind automatically goes well that's that's more than i make that that's that's a lot more than i make and you know i went to college for four years and got a master's degree and that's not our problem, right? But it, it's it's all about how, how we're presenting it. So um, the time and materials, I, I don't do it very often. Maybe uh, when I was starting out, I did um, early in the early days, I think, and I've shared this before, I think I made, um, I was charging 25 bucks an hour and I thought that was great. You know, I was like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm getting 25 bucks an hour. Um, do you know working for friends and people who knew me because I didn't really have a client base, but you know, um, yeah, I, I now that I'm established, no, I would not not do time and materials because it, it's really it, it's it's really weird. It's it, it turns into kind of a no win situation. Like if 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 you hurry up and and do it fast, you know, quick, then there's really no benefit to you. If you go slow, they're going to think you're milking it, and they're kind of always if you're doing time materials, they're kind of always paying attention to what you're doing, like kind of micromanaging, you know, they don't understand you stop by the home Depot to pick up supplies. And again, all the other things that we have to do. So uh, I believe um, square footage piece pricing um, defined line item pricing is a great way to go. If it's just a tile estimate or go with the lump sum and, um, and that's it. I mean, you know, in a, and so that's that's presenting like a formal quote. So but before I even get to this point, usually so this this was a referral job. So I just printed up. I didn't didn't give them a ballpark estimate before. If it's if it's a new lead, um, even a referral, usually the first thing I do is I will get an email. I'll ask them to email me pictures. I will ask them to, you know, just include a, a scope of work and I will. Um, have them email me. Um, so, you know, usually it's a phone conversation, find out a little bit more. Hey, can, you know, can you shoot me an email? 916-TILE at Gmail. Include, include some pictures of what you want. That way I get an idea, a feel for their project. You can even tell a lot by, you know, like maybe the condition of the bathroom and go, yeah, you know, I don't know if this is a good fit for me. You, you can just find out a lot about the pictures to a project without driving you know, out 30 miles across town, cross traffic to, to, to get a feel, you know, don't go chasing every lead like that. This is 2001. We got email, we got pictures, we got FaceTime, we can do it another way. So they email me the pictures. I can get a sense for it. And usually I'll shoot off a ballpark estimate. Okay. So this one, this one is 27 something total. I don't know if I had all this information, I'd say, yeah, you're looking between 25 and 30,000. And usually what I can tell, usually the response you get is, you know, tells whether you're going to get the job or not. It's usually, uh, yeah, that's about what I was thinking. And then, you know, it's a green light. Okay, now we're going to take the next step, get some more information. Maybe I'll drive out there, take some measurements. Um, or it's, um, 
wow, I didn't think it would be that much. Um, and you, and that's, that's fine. But I like to get to those numbers really quickly before I spend too much time. I used to waste so much time driving out to people's houses that had no idea how much this type of work cost. So um, that's the way it starts with a ballpark. And then uh, if it's, if it's going to be a good fit and I would also, um, you know, I, and I, I feel, I feel really blessed to be in this position, but I would also uh, check on the personality. You can also through a phone conversation and a few questions, you can get a general sense of, of how the customer is going to be throughout the project. If you've seen some of my videos and especially like um, one I uploaded uh, two or three weeks ago about a countertop we had to tear out, um, you know, you can, you can run into some customers these days that are extremely troublesome. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. That thing still isn't, resolved after redoing it. But um, so it's very important uh, for you to be vetting your potential clients as well. Like definitely check it out and be honest and don't, don't get in denial because sometimes we go chasing things. Sounds really good. And then when you look back on it, when you do run into these, these trouble uh, clients that you see that there were red flags there, right? You're like, Oh, you know, yeah, I, now that I see it, those warning signs were there. So um, that's also a great opportunity in that, that initial email, filling out, shooting out a, a large number, uh, um, feeling out process. And then you're going to whittle away um, a lot of those clients that you don't want to work for. So I hope that answers some of the questions and I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and see what you guys are saying here. See if I can answer some of your questions. I break my line items to the letter, then the customer can see the large amount of detail involved. That's good. I think the more that we're able to explain in those. And so again, the way, the way I do it with, you know, shooting out a ballpark, big number might not be the best way to do it. If you're just getting started. Um, Again, I get a ton of leads because I, I have a lot of marketing, um, but um, being more detailed in what you're going to do and and under promising, I, I think it's really important for us as tile guys, and we're not always the best communicators, right, is that we we don't over promise. And if if we know if we know before beforehand that there might be issues with something, you know, for example, a really tight grout joint or even something as simple as dust on a job, even something as simple as where we're cleaning out our water, it, the, the more detailed we can be and the better that we can set those expectations and manage the customer's expectations, the better. So I think that's great to be very detailed in, in your estimates of exactly what's going to be done. And then that way the customer can see. Um, I don't know if I, I just wish there was a way for me to, and I'm getting better at it because I have videos of finished products, projects that I can send. I have testimonials that I can send to clients, but still there's no way to, to really completely, um, you know, <laughs> tell the future to the client, like, you know, you're going to be happy with my company. We're going to do a great job. You're going to love it. There's no way to really portray that, but you have to manage the expectations so that um, when it comes to certain things that they know, you know, they don't have it, expectations built way up. You're like, we're not, we're not perfect. We do the very best we can. Let me see what, um, Romualdo Duarte, wait, the countertop lady is still not satisfied. Um, no, she's not. Um, I actually just went over there today. Um, and she's now she's unhappy because I didn't explain to her. Um, we didn't do the existing cabinetry in, in the work. And so the cabinets were out of level. And in my 
in my proposal, we were just taking out the old countertops, putting on new quartz. I had nothing in there for, for cabinet work. Well, when the new countertops went in, we have to make our cabinets level. They're a Euro style cabinet. So the drawer boxes are real close to the bottom of the apron of the 2CM mitered apron on it. So on one side of the kitchen, we're tied up against the drawer. On the other side of the kitchen, because the cabinets are over a half inch out of level, we have a half inch gap between the apron and the drawer box. And, you know, afterwards, you know, now everything, I mean, the countertops are beautiful. I mean, it's, it's really, really on that second install. If you've seen the video, I put everything I had in to make that job, you know, perfect. I, I knew where we were at. We already tore it out once. We already ate it once. I'm like, dude, we are crossing every I, dotting every, or crossing every T, dotting every I. Um, this customer is getting my best because I know we need to make it perfect. So um, we did that countertops beautiful. And she, she's, she's come. Um, I, I don't want to get into this too much because I don't even know where it's going to go from here, but um, might make a really good video. But um, anyways, she, she had said that I should have pointed out to her that her cabinets were not level and that, that that was going to be seen that way. So, I, again, I don't know. I didn't, I don't know. I don't know where we're at with that, but no, it's, it's still not uh, resolved. We're working on it. And um, I had the Caesar stone rep out there today with me. And um, yeah, that was a tough one. Uh, he, she, and actually they, they grilled the, um, you know, they were grilling the, the Caesar stone guy because the uh, picture on the website of the Caesar stone color, you know, on this, on a, on a screen, on a monitor didn't match what, you know, she got on her countertops, even though she had already seen the slabs in person and personally approved the slabs, you know, in person, um, she was still really upset that the, um, you know, the, it didn't match what was shown on Caesar stones website. So all in all, it was a pretty tough, uh, tough meeting um today and um we'll see where it goes and that's another uh another reason why you need to be charging enough money because things like that happen we can't control you know we can only do so much and every once in a while we get into um you know these situations where it's just it's almost like speaking different languages right like i'm trying to explain why you know they're tight to the drawer boxes on one side of the kitchen and a half inch on the other. And she doesn't know she's not in construction. And I thought I've already explained all this stuff, but it's just going right over the head. And it's like, where do you go from there? So I don't know yet. We'll see how that goes, but yeah, I definitely need to be putting enough money in these estimates so that you can deal with those things when they come up or otherwise you're just going to be out of business. I mean, because, um, you know, if when these things hit, you're just going to get discouraged and you're going to if you're just if you're just making what you um, what you in your mind think, like if every job goes perfect, this is what I should be making. You're like, OK, I saw, I know I need to make 600 bucks today. Right. That's what you think. 600 bucks. And you're like, damn. Yeah, I, I knocked out this floor. I made my 600 bucks. That's cool. That's awesome. But you're not putting enough money away for when you run into one of these clients that, you know, just has crazy expectations that doesn't, you know, and it happens. I mean, I, do, again, I do my best. I do, you know, I, and I thought I, I thought I was doing better, but, you know, just kind of a humbling moment, you know, when these things happen, it's like, okay, I don't, I'm not the best at that either. You know, there's something along the line, that uh, I, I played a part in. And again, red flags that I ignored and I just wanted to do the job. So, you know, make sure you're putting, you know, those rainy day funds in, you know, the transmission went out on my Chevy, had 110,000 miles on it and, you know, 10,000 over the warranty and my transmission gets fried in my, you know, my 2015, 2,500. And it's like, okay, seven grand, boom, seven. It's like, dang, you know, and so, you know, running a business is different. I mean, it's just, you, you got to have the money in your estimates to take care of those things. Or again, you're just going to, you're going to throw up the white flag and you're like, dude, this isn't for me. 
I'm working for nothing. And then these things hit and I'm going to go, I'm going to go work for Amazon or something. I don't know. I'm going back to school. So uh, make sure you're putting enough money in those estimates. Let's see. Um, Will in the area is thousand dollars a day reasonable or still too cheap? A thousand dollars a day is about the going rate. Um, I would say it's closer to twelve hundred for a crew. Yeah, that's about right. You know, for a setter and a helper, twenty twelve hundred in our area, Northern California, Sacramento is about the going rate that um, a regular tile guy would charge. Um, you know running a business this this would be like subcontracted it, like so if i were to subcontract a tile crew to come in i would probably expect to be be paying that much per day to them so that that's a that's about right will that's about um you know if you have a helper i'd probably be up around 1200 if you're by yourself thousands probably good that's good money man that's that's really good money who would have thought right just tile guy <laughs> making that kind of money. It's awesome. Yeah. So Harad 19 made a good point here. He said, that's rough. We definitely show the level and the gap before the stone goes on, then give an option to leave it. So we, we do things a little different, you know, we're using two CM with a mitered apron edge it's a little different. Most of the, the country uses a 3CM where you would definitely see any gap or reveal. But we have, you know, we have the overhang coming out and it's actually built off of the cabinet about an inch. So to see it, you really kind of need to get up, you know, underneath the cabinet and look up. I mean, it could be trimmed out with a scribe molding or something, uh, but it's not like it's not like a 3CM where it's sitting right on top of the, the countertop. We do 2CM here. I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe somebody can comment why um, California does 2CM material and everybody else is doing 3CM, but that's what we do here. Uh, Drew is asking for good lead sources. Home Advisor Angie's List. I would stay away from those companies. I've I have heard nightmare stories about Home Advisor, and I've I haven't dealt with them other than them calling me trying to sell their service. But I've heard that it's it's like a a contract you can't get out of. And I hear people that have had to cancel their bank accounts because even after they cancel it, the charges keep coming. And there's like minimum, you know, they they just have a way of really, really sucking you dry for um, these. I don't know. It might work for, I would say, maybe if you were doing just service calls, it might work. Like if you were a um, tile repair business or if you were just doing backsplashes or if you're doing something like a, a, a water heater or, you know, something that was just like a, a bam, bam, in and out. And you were trying to book like two or three uh, appointments a day. Maybe Home Advisor would be a way to go or Angie's List or whatever, but they've just never worked for me. I mean, the quality of the leads is usually terrible. You're paying for them all. Um, uh, to get leads, I would I would go to tile shops. I would network. I would, um, you know, just do a great freaking job. If you're just starting out, the best thing you can do is just do a killer job for somebody. Ask them to write reviews for you. Um, ask them to um, tell their friends, you know, put a yard sign out, get, get something on your truck that shows who you are and, you know, just uh, do it that way. Tile shops are a great source. Believe it or not, tile shops are always looking for installers, um, especially if you're going to come in and you're not established and you're charging a little bit less. Think about it. If a tile shop can sell their tile for, um, you know, they're selling their tile and if they can get somebody to, to do the install a little bit cheaper, that's better for them. They can buy more tile, right? If they're referring really, if they're referring really expensive installers, that kind of, kind of hurts them. They might lose the sale because they can't, 
you know, the tile doesn't do any good without an install. So um, that's really how I got my start was through referrals through a tile shop. And then once you do good, man, it just starts, starts going. Yeah. Harad is doing, yeah. 3CM. So a little bit different. Okay, the best leads are word of mouth or Facebook neighborhood groups. They've gotten me a lot of work. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not on Facebook, but I could see how that would probably be a good way, especially local. I think you can probably get, a, you know, set it up. Yeah, if it's a neighborhood thing, set it up for um, a local. Um, there's probably just going to be a lot to wade through, you know. Right on. Stone S, fellow tile guy from New Jersey. Love the videos. Andre asks, how much to charge per day to do a bathroom? Again, a little bit different. You know, it's, a, it's you know, it, it's it's hard to say, you know, across the board, across our, our big, diverse, wide country of what uh, you should be charging per day. But again, $100 an hour um, if you're licensed, if you're experienced, um, did I say hundred dollars a day, hundred dollars an hour, if you're licensed, experienced, um, and you're a quality installer, that's, that's like, I think that's where you would start. You know, I think that's where you would just start. So figure out, you know, that's $800 a day minimum. You're going to have some donut money mixed up in that. And, um, you know, if you got employees, that's a whole different thing. Um, actually setting the prices is, is a tough thing to talk about on here because every, everyone is different. Um, I wanted to just more talk about how, how I go through my process of estimating well, cause I've already figured out what costs I need, how to present that, you know, without in an efficient, you know, also in an efficient way, because the more, uh, a lot of you guys are, are working in the field and doing your estimates so the more efficient you can get the information out there uh, without spending so much time the, the more you can do and the more tile you can set so um you know i i had i had a, a viewer who came in and stopped by a couple weeks ago I actually bought one of the hats that i have so if you want one of these hats go to tilecoach.com i i dig them they're uh, they're the flex fit and um, really comfortable nice hats um if you support our channel it just it helps me um actually what what i've been doing lately i'm planning another trip like we did uh for the denver project that we did last year in the shower for Bo. Uh, actually they were just out here um they came to visit they they just left today they were out here they got here last friday um we spent a lot of time together we've been come really close with their family jason eiley and Bo, and kobe and um if you haven't seen that project, look up my videos, the shower for bow project. It, it was just a really cool thing that we were able to do for that family. Um, you guys donated actually to a um, GoFundMe account, Emser Tile and Laticrete donated. And um, Bo, who had his feet amputated when he was a baby, needed a shower. Um, the dad was struggling to get it done. And we just went out there and just did um we, we did the whole thing for them but since then you know they've become like family uh we talk all the time and they actually came out for a week and we we spent some time together it was just awesome it was just just really cool um and so we're planning another project you know and so i, I just want to share too like the other day so i was talking about the countertop that we had to redo and i got that i got that email on Friday, basically threatening to go after my bond and, you know, file a complaint with the contractor's state license board, which I've never had a complaint filed against me. Um, and, you know, threatening to go after my bond after everything was cool, man. It was like, I thought we were done. They paid, 
husband said he was happy. She actually said she was happy too. I went over, looked over everything. Yeah, it was good. They paid me. Thank you for redoing it. It looks so much better. A couple of weeks go by and we're still waiting on a window that's back ordered because, um, you know, long story short, we're waiting on a window that needs to go in. And so I, she asked for the date when it would be in. I told her we're still a couple of weeks away. And then two days later, I get an email that's just like this punch list of everything that she thinks wrong with the cabinets, everything. And so I got that email on on a Friday and I was just bummed. I was like, man, that just sucks. What a way to start the weekend. You know, Friday afternoon, I get this email. And so I was just feeling a little down, you know, and um, and then I get this phone call from a viewer who calls me up and he just left a message because I don't. I, you know, my office line, I'm getting calls all the time and I don't get to answer them, but he left a message and he was just like, he was just like really encouraging. He's like, your videos have helped me so much. He told me about um, the shower that he built and he was just so happy that he did it. And he's just really thankful, thanking me for my videos. And then he just kind of went on and he was just like, you know, you're a man of integrity. I just, you know, just everything. He was just, he was just, telling me all these things that I really needed to hear at the time. And I had this other project that was, I was kind of on the fence about too, like someone had reached out from Florida and Fort Myers, Florida, who really needed some help. And um, his brother-in-law who he was really close to um, passed away after he had torn out his shower because he was going to rebuild his shower. And he had a heart attack after tearing it out like the next day. And so their bathroom has been unfinished for um, since um, since like February or something. And he said, you know, he was just asking questions like, you know, what what should I use and and everything. And I just felt really moved. Um, you know, he was doing that for his sister and he just shared this story about, you know, the time he got to spend with his brother in law. And I was like, dude. I'll do what I can. I didn't make any promises. I was just like, you know, I'll, I'll see if I can help you. Maybe I can get an installer in Florida to uh, help you out. And um, anyways, I got that voicemail after, you know, I got that discouraging email and he was just talking about purpose. And, you know, he's, we talked, talked about some spiritual stuff and he was like, you know, this is bigger than you, you know, what you're doing. It, it's bigger than you. And and that just, I mean, that just really hit me so, so much because, and it just gave me the sense of purpose. Like this, this isn't just about me. It's not just about me, you know, you know, money comes in and money goes out. That's how running a business feels a lot of the time, right? You, you know, after you do it for a while, it's like the jobs just get done and, you know, your money comes in, you're paying bills and you're like, what's the point? Yeah. YouTube is awesome. And, but sometimes I lose the point of that too, because I'm just like editing videos and getting videos out there while I'm trying to do all my other stuff. And, um, and that, that, you know, that phone call like changed it for me. I was like, you know what, this is, this is, this is so much, this world needs this so much. And, and yeah, and I can do my part and I feel the best. And I remember, and it took me back to how I felt, when I did Jason and Bo's and shower and how all of you guys helped and pitched in. And it was just like this beautiful moment. Um, we were in the middle of COVID and all the craziness with the, the BLM stuff going on. And I remember just, just the hope that came out of that and how, how good I felt and the sense of purpose of just being a part of it and something about being a part of the whole team, not just like, um, again, not just me doing something, but like have everybody help and be a part of it. And that's what I felt like that phone call was doing at that moment when I was feeling discouraged about someone threatening to go to the license board about me. It's something I already worked my ass off and, and redone once already. And I was just like, and then I get this call about Isaac, this isn't just about you. This is something bigger. And then I was like, I was like, that's my sign, man. And so I'm going to be going out to Florida uh, the end of the summer here. And, um, Jason is actually going to come out too. Cause Jason was with me when I got that, that phone call. And I just, I just let him listen to the, to the voicemail too. And he was like, we got to do this, Isaac, we got to go out there and do this. So I was like, dude, it's on. And, um, so I reached back out to the, the, 
his name's Chris. So he actually lives up in Maine. His sister's down in Fort Myers, Florida. So I was like, dude, don't worry about anything. Cause he had all these questions, right? He's like, well, I don't know if I'm doing curdy or do I do this or do I do pan line or do I do pre, you know, he had all these questions. I was like, dude, you don't need to ask any more questions. I'm going to line it up. I'll hook up with installers in the area, borrow some tools. Um, I'll get manufacturers to kick in. We're just going to get it done. I don't care. And I'm, I'm not looking, I didn't want to do like a fundraising campaign. I wanted to be this more out of like the tile coach general fund or whatever. Um, but if you do want to, uh, that's how I got on this whole thing with the hat, huh? But if you do want to help, um, you can just, just go to tilecoach.com, you know, buy some, buy a hat, buy a t-shirt, you know, that stuff will just kind of fund. And I'm, I'm just hoping that I can kind of keep, keep it going. Right. Because again, that's, that's where I feel feel at my best is when I'm part of a bigger, bigger thing. When it's not when it's just me, it's I can get it can get really lonely. And I just don't see the part. I'm just like, man, I'm just grinding. I'm just going through the motions. Nothing. Yeah, I I got this going on. But unless unless it's that part of a whole and a bigger picture thing. Oh, that's what makes me that's what makes me tick, man. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm glad I'm, I'm just, I feel blessed, man. I'm, um, so happy to, to be here and have you guys a part of this. We got 177 of y'all just, just hanging out and listening to me. Um, it's, it's a dream come true, you guys. And it, again, it wouldn't be what it is without you. As I read all your comments, I love, love seeing this um you know the i've thought about you know like i consider um i consider tile work in itself an art i consider um youtube and making videos and the way that i produce and edit and kind of direct the videos i create that to be an art form and i love looking at it that way that i'm i'm creating art for um, people to see the thing that um that I've realized and I was kind of just meditating on this of what, what artwork is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, it's not like, um, you know, James Hetfield from Metallica just, you know, comes up with this riff and, and, and that's it. I think it's like, you know, it's the experience of the person that's creating, creating whatever they're creating, whatever medium that is music, video, um, tile, they're creating it but it's, it's being consumed and almost pulled along by whoever's consuming it. And it's almost like, it's almost like the audience or whoever's watching is pulling it out of the creator. And it's just this really cool thing that, that art wouldn't happen without everybody involved. The, the rock concert wouldn't be happening without the audience. And it's, it's like this reciprocal thing. And so I feel like I'm being pulled along by you guys. I feel like it's like, um, you know, when I get the encouragement, you know, I get two or three emails a day that are just so encouraging. I get the comments right now. And it's like, um, I feel like you guys are pulling, pulling this whole thing along. And then, then I create the art and, and this is what you guys want. You know, I feel like, I feel like these projects, like the, um, you know, whenever I'm helping somebody or whenever, you know, whether it was the Jason and Bo project in Denver, whether it was, um, you know, we went up and helped Drew. I talked to Drew today. I was just on a, you know, on a kick today. I talked to Drew up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, whether it was the project we wanted to help them or whether it's this Fort Myers project, it, it wouldn't happen without you guys. It's like you guys are making, Uh, me a better person by pulling pulling me along you guys keep you hold me accountable i mean it's it's like all of all of these things are just just wonderful so um (laughs) you know i don't know um and please don't take it personally like if i if i can't respond to you because i i can't open every email or um you know, mess Instagram's really hard. I've been really flooded with the Instagram stuff. And, um, I'll, you know, I just, I just can't get to it with all the stuff that I have going on, but I do see, 
I do see it coming in and I do check on it as much as I can. So um, just thank you guys. I feel so blessed to have you have you here. Um, let me see. <laughs> Thomas, amen, brother. Keep it up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I get emotional. I, I shouldn't apologize. I get, I'm an emotional person. Um, he said he almost cried at the end of the video when we talked about them being family. Um, yes. And Zach was there. Zach was there too. Um, Zach of all trades. He, he went to uh, Denver with us and he was there. Um, I think Zach cried too. So it wasn't just me, but yeah, they, they, um, you know, these, these projects and bringing people together and sharing the good news, you know, um, it doesn't sell, unfortunately, like um, fear um, sells, like the media puts out there, right? It just seems like everything's fear, you know, just everything, you know, that's what sells. You put a death counter up on the news and people are going to watch it. You tell people that, you know, they're going to die if they go outside. They're going to they're going to watch it. Um, so I'm you know, we can all do our part, right? Let's let's try to carry a message of hope and and bring and show the goodness in people in our communities instead of, um, you know, you know, the message of fear and, and hate and division that um, seems to just sell so well. So I don't know. I'm kind of rambling here, but um, I'll read a few more comments and um, let me know. Let me know anything, guys. Um, you know, what you'd like to see, you know, again, I'm creating artwork and you guys are seeing it. So what would you like to see? Oh, Jeremiah. Okay. Um, the IQ video. Yeah, man, I'm going to, I'm going to be, um, I'll break that baby out. You know, it's, uh, the IQ has been sitting in a rack on my, uh, in my shop for, I don't think we've used it in like a year. And, um, I love seeing the biased reviews that some people do, you know, it's like, you know, people, they unbox it and they're like, oh, it does this and it does that. And it does this It's like, yeah, try it for a year and see how it cuts on this type of porcelain and see what happens when you try a U cut and you got to lift the tile up and all those other things. So yeah, we're going to do a really honest review. And isn't that awesome that I'm not relying on like uh, sponsorships for manufacturers or anything. I'll, I'll make a review and I'll be honest about it. But um I guess, I guess a little, um, little foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. It's been sitting there for about a year. So I paid, I bought it used. Um, and I paid like 1300 bucks. I think it was like 1700 new. And that should have been a, a sign right there. If a, a setter is selling a, a lightly used tile saw, it's probably not very good, but, um, we used, you know, we've been using it and, and use it on a couple jobs and just fought it. And, but yeah, I'll do, I'll do a review. I'll, I'll, um, you know, and it might work good. And some, you know, some people say they, they love it, but they're probably saying they love it because they spent 1700 bucks on it. What else are you going to say? But, um, you know, I, I think they got a ways to go with their technology and, uh, wet saws work great. You know, they just do. So, <laughs> How do you deal with customer with barking dogs or little heel biting dogs? Yeah. If you get in with one of those, those herding dogs, like an Australian shepherd or something, I got, I got bit, actually I got bit, I got bit right on my chest, like right on my nipple by a, um, a poodle, a standard poodle. It was really weird. They're, you know, they're big, not like the little poodles It's a big poodle there. And she, the customer is a, a poodle breeder and <laughs> I walk up to the door and like five of them come running up and um, they're the, the cinnamon colored 
standard poodles really beautiful dogs but they're scary man they're like a a big dog and i have dogs I, i've always had dogs around i've never been bit by a dog and it just jumped up on my chest and just bit me i go whoa and was, i don't know if it was you know getting frisky with me or what but um and also so and then also the um Austra like australian shepherds collies you know they just want to kind of like they kind of want to move you along you know because they're herding dogs they're not really like trying to to hurt you or anything they're just kind of like trying to push you around or something but yeah i don't know the dogs are dogs are cool man i'm a dog person i don't i don't uh, trip on dogs too much mm -hmm. yeah jeremiah said if it's if i'm picky if it's chippy i can't accept it yes uh, iqs are chippy tile saws and I think it depends on on the uh, I, <laughs> nipple poodle. I think I think um, the IQs might work on certain tiles, and you know, one of those things. You know, it's going to be like, you know, I, I run into the, the thing with hand cutters too. You know, like the um, the monoliths and everything. And I know people use them. Some people use them exclusively, but you're going to run into tiles that they don't work on or they're chip, you know, they chip on them. And I just, you know, I just don't, I just hate that when you get into something and you're like not knowing if it's going to work out or not. I want, you know, I want something that a tile side I know is going to work on every single tile, um, you know, glass tile, ceramic, porcelain, you know, good wet saw, the DeWalt, you know, 24,000. It's a great saw it's half the price of an iq you could buy two of them if you wanted to they contain the water really well if you're worried about water put it in a mud box you know um or something you can build a little containment you know you, you can you can do water control but um yeah i think i think the iq is going to um just kind of go away but i'll be doing an honest review on it so check it out and I'm not, I mean, it, it sounds like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I already have my mind made up about it, but I don't have anything to gain or lose from telling you if one saw is better than I, DeWalt doesn't pay me anything. DeWalt's never even, you know, I haven't even thought of that. Um, so I have nothing against DeWalt. We have Husqvarna's, we have, I have a Ruby. I have all kinds of tile saws. I have a rigid, I have, you know, I'm not set on one brand. So if a tile saw was good, I would tell you. So I'm not like, I know it sounds like I have this thing against IQ, but I just don't like it because it sucks. I'm not, okay, and there I go again. It doesn't, I can't say it sucks. And maybe it works for, for you guys out there. For us, for what we do, California, water's not a big deal. It's usually good weather. So I'll do a review on it though. Oh, uh, let's see. We got, um, are we, am I still using the rigid saw? No, I actually left that saw for Drew up in Idaho. That was part of, um, and that's what I might do in Florida too. Um, I might, you know, if I can buy a tile saw for 300 bucks, it's, that's cheaper than sending one out there or so yeah, that rigid, I actually left with Drew so he could do his other bathroom with it, but it's a great little saw. The Ruby that I have, I've had for probably five or six years. I have a seven inch Ruby and it's awesome. I love that saw. If I could use that saw in every job, I would. It's just so easy to, to, um, you know, move around and, um, just light, easy cuts. Great. Um, the seven inch blades are really straight. So yeah, that rigid saw for the price, man. Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't know for sure because I don't have it, but my Ruby is pretty much the same same thing. You can get a good seven inch saw for three hundred bucks. I definitely recommend having a seven inch for your your subway tiles, your backsplashes, even small floors, and then a Dewalt uh, twenty four thousand. Um, one of my guys has the thirty six thousand, um, the bigger Dewalt. I don't think I would get that one. I mean, it just, it's just so big. It's, it's, um, I don't know. It just seems so big. Yeah. Zach, I think he has a seven inch Delta beast. Um, I've never used Zach saw, but, uh, I think it works good. Um, 
All right, what else we got? Oh, so Zach was saying that, um, I think he was saying the IQ uh, works good on soft tile and then hit it with a hundred pad. So <laughs> if you got a soft tile and uh, you want to throw a hundred pad on your, your uh, polisher and polish the edges of every tile, then hey, I guess it would work, but... So I guess I guess the IQ would probably work well. Um, the reason I bought it, so the reason I even thought of buying it, we didn't need another tile saw, was because we were working up in Lake Tahoe in the winter, and we didn't want to deal with cold water, and so we wanted. Um, I thought, oh, that you know, this is a perfect you know solution for that, you know, bring it inside, and um, but. It was still dusty. You know, we brought it inside and there was still, you know, if you lift up the tile at all, the, the vacuum can't suck it up. And, um, you know, chips, just chips everywhere. And the, the fin, yeah, we were having to send, and then we were having to take the tiles outside and sand them all down. So we were still doing a bunch of extra work that um, a wet saw would have just been, you know, done. <laughs> I dated a girl with a lazy eye once. Turns out she was seeing someone else the whole time. <laughs> okay, I got okay, I got a joke. I got a um since I still have 170 guys in here, I'm going to keep going, but um I, I'll 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 tell you a joke here. So the joke is um why did the scarecrow get a promotion? Because he was outstanding in his field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. That was a good one. We were actually, actually that joke, we were up in Boise, Idaho. Uh, my daughter just graduated from Boise state. And so we were up in Boise, uh, lot, it was about a month ago. And me and Marissa are just, we're sitting at, at one of the restaurants, downtown Boise. And our kids went outside to walk around um, they wanted to just check out Boise. So it was just Marissa and I, and this, this drunk dude comes up and sits down right in our booth. And I was, we were like, okay, you know, we're, we're in a booth, like at a table and he just sits down and he orders a beer and we're like, oh, Hey, what's up? So we start talking to him. And that's the first thing he said. He said that joke. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I guess. But then he kind of, then he, then it turned awkward because then our kids came back and one of our daughters is, um, is 20. And then he was like hitting on her and like asking her for his phone number in front of us. And we're like, okay, how do we get this guy like out of here? This was cool. And he just sat down and said a joke, but now it's getting weird. So, um, you know, Idaho can be a little weird. All you, all, all you Idahoans, um, beautiful place. I love Idaho, but, um, yeah, it's a little different out there. If, if you're in California, you know, everybody. So the thing is with California right now, everybody's pissed off and wants to move out of here. So um, Texas, Idaho, Florida, you know, like there's, there's this exodus out of California. And um, but before you go, you might want to go check it out for a little bit because, you know, other places aren't like California, good or bad, but I at least check it out. Uh, let's see. In the middle of my shower install, can I set my mud bed directly on my concrete slab without a liner to my flow effects drain and waterproof? I'm in Florida. Your videos are awesome. Yes, no pre-slope, dude. Right on your slab. Get a slurry of thin set. Slap that slurry down on the slab to help that deck the surface and make it one. Yep, do your flow. No liner or anything. Great question. See, I need to do live stream topics. What I want to do is is the difference. So um, one of the things that I think is the biggest, what I would say, um, misconception or misunderstanding about waterproofing a shower is the difference between a pan liner type installation, which requires a pre-slope, then your pan liner, then another float and the bonded waterproof method, which we do with Curdy or other membranes on top. So it's two different methods, but people get them confused. They think, well, uh, 
you know, they see me do the flow effects. They're like, well, where's your pre-slope? It's like, there is no pre-slope in that system. So uh, I do have a video. I mean, if you're checking this out and you see it, I do have a video on flow effects. Did it about a couple months ago. I explain, um, actually show installing um, exactly what that question was. Um, I forgot the name of the video. I think it was, um, uh, I did the corner tuck method on it too. Let me see what, what's the title of that video. I'm going to look that up real quick. Content. If you want to see how those flow effects drains go in, which we, we saw on our website, tilecoach.com. If you need a flow effects drain, we got them on there. Sales are through the roof on those. It's been awesome. Okay. Um, yep. Okay. F the title of that video is flow effects shower drain on actual job tutorial. And that was uh, uploaded on April 1st. So that's a great video if you want to know how to install those flow effects trains. Jeremiah says, Florida is amazing. Yeah, I can't wait to go out to uh, Fort Myers and check out uh, what, what it's like down there. I've never been uh, east of Texas, so we'll see. Yeah, Brian Longnecker said the flow effects is great. If you do those systems, if you do Curdy, if you do bonded waterproofing systems, you need to check out the flow effects. I promise you won't be uh, disappointed. They're so much better than those Curdy drains. <laughs> Jeffrey, I Jeffrey said I'm a GC in Northern. Uh, is that Missouri? MS. Um, I watch you all the time, knowing how important design is to you. Do you have a job that sticks out that a homeowner picked something terrible? Um, you know, most of the time we help out with design, so we don't really have that problem. I saw a picture on Instagram though. Usually. Usually a bad design comes from a tile guy, and I'm going to explain why, because tile guys like to use what they already have. So uh, tile guys, you know, they usually got, you know, 40 or 50 square feet of this. They got um, 13 lineal feet of this liner. They got, um, you know, this mosaic for the shower pan. So tile guys, side yard, their bone yard, they got everything. And so... I saw this picture on Instagram and it was like right off the bat, I recognized, I was like, dude, this was a tile guy just using up all of his stuff because none of it went together. They had like a, a modern mosaic liner with like metal and glass. Then they had like the arabesque ceramic, which is like a Mediterranean kind of old world Spanish look. And then they had um, pebbles on the floor, which is like a Zen kind of spa feel. And then they had, I think they had like, marble look porcelain on the walls and the whole thing was just like whoa dude like <laughs> like eight different tiles like and you could tell they had stopped like halfway up and then started with another tile so it was like yeah so anyways i'm sure you guys can relate to that i'm sure um you've probably done that in your own house too <laughs> like i used to i was like oh i got this tile we got to use it somewhere and then afterwards like i wish i would have just bought tile I wanted. Thomas Lavinway. Let me know if you come to Virginia. And I'd like to, yeah, maybe you know what I need to do is get like a, a motor coach. And um, you know, when my kids get a little bit older, we still have young kids. See that too. That's our youngest is um he's 12. So we can't go too far. But I mean that's gonna be kind of um coming soon you know we've thought about you know maybe getting a, a motor coach and hitting the road and seeing all you guys and meeting doing doing meetups and doing uh, coaching and doing instructional stuff you know in person and and just finding out you know i want to see our country man we got such a diverse beautiful country that i've seen people and you know different cultures and just everything and uh, we've kind of been in California, you know, it's a cool place, but you know, we haven't really gone out. And then like our vacations, we tend to go to like Hawaii or Mexico or something, but there's so much 
of the U.S. that I haven't seen. So I'd love to get out to Virginia and see, you know, see what it's like out there in the country and see what it's like in the cities. And so, yeah, hopefully someday I'll be able to get out, you know, and um, we'll travel and, and meet people. Brian Longnecker says, I'm on Kauai. Come come out and see me. Um, yeah, Kauai, um, we haven't been there. We've been to Maui a few times and we've been to um, Honolulu. But uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, we went, we went to Maui in, in, um, we went to Maui in December and it was pretty, um, you know, they were, they weren't real happy to see people, you know, because of COVID. I don't like going places that I'm don't feel welcome and um, didn't feel real welcome in Hawaii last time. So I don't know, but maybe if I know, know someone like you, Brian, um, there's also another guy, um, Thomas Tanagawa, Tanagawa, I think. Um, Shower Rehab is his handle on Instagram. He's he's in Kauai too. But yeah, I'd love to meet up with uh, people everywhere. Just talk tile. It's so awesome. And if you're in if you're in Northern California, you know, hit me up. Maybe um, we can do something. I'll be in San Diego, and I'll be I'll be posting this too. If you're um, if you're in SoCal. I'm going to be in San Diego September 30th for the uh, San Diego Thailand Marvel annual golf uh, scramble that they have down there. It's a huge event. There's like 140 people participating and they got a raffle. The San Diego tile community is just incredible. I have a video on that too, if you haven't seen it, but um, I'll be back down there um, the end of September and I'm thinking of doing a meetup where um, I'd like to, you know, maybe do a little demo. I'll talk with them at San Diego Tile and Marble. I don't know how, I don't know, you know, every place we go is different with the whole COVID thing. You just don't know. People are still being kind of, kind of weird. But um, where we're at, it's, it's pretty much like gone. A few people wearing masks and stuff, but um, haven't even heard of anybody. Um, getting sick in the longest time. I know one person that personally that's gotten sick from COVID, uh, they already had some, some health issues. They made it. I don't know anybody who's passed away. I'm sure some of you have, but I don't want to lessen that. But um, I live in California in a county with 400,000 people. Don't know anybody who's passed away. One person that's gotten sick. I've had one employee that um, got COVID and it was like a cold. So, um, you know, um, anyways, oh, Robert Martinez, what's up, Chris? How's your golf game? Um, golf game, it's up and down, man, peaks and valleys. But I'm I'm down to a, a – I think I'm down to a 10-3. What's my handicap right now? I think I'm down to like a 10-3 or something. Um, played yesterday with Jason, and our club was set up for a tournament, and it – um, um, oh yeah. So 10, yeah, I'm 10.1 right now. So I've been playing some pretty good golf, Chris. Um, love to play with you, man. And, uh, but yeah, my club was set up, uh, for a tournament that they're doing. They're doing a three day tournament. It was a $500 person buy-in. And, um, so it's like a big deal, right? That's, that's a lot of money. I like the tournaments where you kick in 25, 50 bucks, <laughs> but, um, it was, uh, man the greens the greens were rolling like 12 13 it was windy it was it was probably like 15 20 mile an hour winds i think i shot 90 which i felt pretty good about but um it was tough uh, we play sierra view country club and it's a 128 slope so uh it's challenging it's not not nothing brutal but um when the greens get going like that man you got to be on the right side of the hole or you're just done so uh yeah Chris and I, Chris worked with me for a while, and Chris, uh, I think we played out at Diamond Oaks a couple times. Uh, so, yeah, good to hear from you, Chris. Hope was all, all is well with you and uh, your family. Hope everything's going good. Um, stop by and see me sometime. All right, so I'm running like an hour and 15 minutes. You guys have probably heard enough from me. Um, let's see, maybe answer one more question and I'll get out of here. Uh, 
Uh, if I can do it, you can too. I'm hearing mixed things about whether you actually need a general contractor's license. In California, you need a general contractor's license um, to do any, well, you need a license to do any work over 600 bucks. We have specialty licenses. A C54 is a classification for tile, which I got in 2003. Uh, I got my, which is a pretty, pretty easy license to obtain. I mean, um, I think you need somebody to vouch for you that says you have four years of journeyman experience, but they don't, I don't think they really check too much into it. At least they didn't when I got mine. Um, the general contractors, which I got in 2015, that's a whole nother level. It has to be proven with either payroll records or permits, job permits, or um, they don't just hand those out. And I know state to state is different. Uh, I think in Florida, Florida, you probably don't even need a license. Texas, I don't think you need a license. So you need to check with your, uh, your state. They all just have... Um, they all just have a different, you know, a boy, uh, Idaho. I don't think you need a license in Idaho based on the, the work that I've seen out there. Oh my gosh. Some of the stuff that's done in the houses. Um, I had a good friend who, who fleed California. I, not a good friend, but a good Instagram friend fleed California. He's a great tile setter. Uh, RJ Dyer. Um, he's up in, uh, he's up in Nampa, Idaho. And I think he's trying to get his foot in the door. But the, the big problem is, is getting people to pay for quality. Because if you don't, if there's no licensing, if there's no standard to do it, um, the quality of the work is just down and the people doing it. So it's a tough market to, to get into. But, um, you know, California for, you know, you think, you think, um, you think about, I have kind of mixed feelings, right? Because I'm, I'm, uh, I think, you know, as far as like licensing and permits and rules in general and, you know, having to pay government to do things, you know, I, I'm kind of have a, an attitude like people should be able to do what they want and customers should be able to pay who they want to do it. Maybe they can't afford a real quality person to do it. Um, but at the same time, um, I really respect the countries like Australia um, and a lot of the Euro European countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden, uh, Germany, that have really high standards for their trade workers, um, you know, and it kind of kind of brings brings everything up. So I, I have mixed feelings on it. I don't I don't know. I, I can't say if if I think um, there should be like mandatory education or training for the trades. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think it would be a good thing, but I don't know. It says, did you get a TCNA license? I don't think TCNA has a license. Um, TCNA, um, the TCNA, uh, the TCNA, people get confused um, with what the TCNA is. The TCNA and the NTCA are two different organizations. The TCNA is, is basically has, has the guidebook for standards on, on the tile trade. Um, pretty much every method is in here. Um, I think there is some influence from manufacturers, which is, you know, that's just America. That's the way things are. Um, but you know, the TCNA, no, there's no licensing for TCNA. They're just a, they're just a group that, um, sets standards for tile installation and, um, it, it holds up in court. Like if, if there's a dispute or anything, or architects will call out certain methods to be used. Um, the NTCA, which is a national tile contractors association, which I'm actually a part of, I think, I don't I don't know if um, it's expired yet. Um, they do training. Um, I don't think you really get a license. Maybe there's a little certificate, kind of like my my Schluter certificate right here when you go and, and attend their um, sales seminar, I mean, their training seminar. Uh, you know, they'll give you a certificate. You know, um, it just means you attended, basically. 
so yeah, I don't know if the the NTCA, the National Tile Contractors Association, gives out certificates, but they they have some good training. Um, I'm not going to say anything bad about them. I just don't know. Um, I don't know. I've never used them. I paid for, I think it's $600 a year to be um, in the NTCA. And I was just basically supporting our trade. I'm not really looking for anything from it. Uh, but they, uh, <sighs> you know, they send me a ton of email marketing now, which is really frustrating. You know, it'll be like, um, you know, bidding software or uh, workers compensation or insurance stuff you know they you get on their mailing list and all of a sudden you, you get a bunch of um, doing a bunch of sales pitches and the vouchers are kind of a pain in the butt you know they give you some vouchers and uh, you know we have four or five national tile wholesalers here in Sacramento we got Dow tile we got Emser tile we got Arizona tile um, who else American Olean um, who am I missing? Bedrosians. So, um, you know, they took, they accepted the vouchers, but they didn't want to because it's really a pain in the butt for them to get reimbursed because a lot of them, it's manufacturer vouchers. So um, I don't know for whatever that's worth. Cause I think they make the pitch. Well, you get like offered like a thousand dollars in vouchers if you, sign up for the $600 membership. It's basically a wash, but it's not that cut and dry. It's kind of hard to use the vouchers and you got to find somewhere to use them. So. Jason Elkins, have you taken the CTI? No, I haven't. Someone reached out to me the other day from it. I thought, I think that would be cool maybe to have my my shop do it, make a video and do, um, yeah, make a video of the whole process maybe. And I think it'd be cool. I think the CTI is, is good. I think it's, I think they're missing a lot of stuff. I, you know, cause I talked with Sal about it and I was like, well, what's on the CTI? And he, he told me what it is, you know, you got to lay out and you got to do this in a timed thing. And I guess that's good. But I was like, I was like, well, do you have to float the shower pan or he goes, Oh no, you don't do any mud work. And I'm thinking, really? Like it's a certified tile installer and you don't have to know how to float a shower pan. So I think, I think they maybe expand on it. Maybe there's certifications you can get, but um, I think mud work, if you're going to be called a certified tile installer, if you can't float a shower pan, you shouldn't be called a certified tile installer. That's just my opinion because there's going to be times where you're going to be required to do that. But um, I would do it. I would do the CTI just to see what it's about. It'd be funny if I didn't pass it. It would probably make a really good video. <laughs> but I think I could pass it, you know. Um, I'm sure all my guys would. But I, I hear it's, it, you know, you, you got to move pretty quick and everything. <laughs> Zach says to be a CTI, you need to chop 25 bags of mud. <laughs> so Kirk, Kirk, my guy, um, Kirk, you've seen Kirk on my videos. They floated a shower. So we're not, we, we haven't been floating all our showers lately. We've been using a lot of board on the walls. We always float our pans, but um, we floated a, he floated a shower and a tub back today, 22 bags of mud, 22 bags of fat mud upstairs in a remodel. So Kirk is, 52 years old and still, still kicking ass, man. Um, Slow Don says, how can I move to California and start a business there? Um, Slow I don't, I don't know, man. It should be a good place, you know, right? If, if, if there's an exodus out of California and this is the way I look at it, I think this would be a great, great live stream topic too, of, of doing business in California and um, why I'm still here. Um, you know, if, if people are moving out because they don't like the politics or the, the housing prices or whatever gripes um, people have with um, California, you know, if there's a lot of people moving out, um, it should be good for people like me staying, I would think. So I think if you wanted to move to California, 
it's probably a better time now than it ever has been. If there's like a net loss of people coming out, it's probably a good time to move in. That's what I'm thinking. But California is a great place to work. Again, like if um, I have no problems with it, are, you know, if there's permits and licensing that you have to do or taxes, you know, it's a level playing field. Everybody has to do it. So it's passed on to the consumer. So it's not really um, an issue. The The prices are great for, for doing installs. The weather's really good. We've got great weather. Shoot. This week, it's been like 80 degrees all week in the middle of June with, with like a nice sea breeze coming in. It's just been beautiful. And, um, you know, we were up in Boise, Idaho and in May and man, it was just this biting North cold wind, just dry and there's no trees around. And I'm like, yeah, really sweet people. But, um, California has a lot to offer. It really does. Um, we were just up in the mountains up near Tahoe, spent three days there. Um, we're going to be down at Dillon's beach, which is just North of San Francisco. We're going to spend three days down there at the end of the month. And so we got the ocean, we got the mountains, we got really good weather. And we got a lot of crazy people too. But um, I think if you just stay in your own lanes, it's it's okay. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to get out of here, but I got people encouraging me to stay on. There's still 141 of you guys. And I love you guys. I do. I love, love you guys. And you probably wonder, like, why do I say that? Like, how can you say that? That's a good question. Like, I've thought about that. I'll bet I'm like, I tell you guys that I love you and you probably are wondering like, how can, how can he love me? He doesn't even know me, but I already know that I do. I just, I love people. I even love the lady who is threatening to go after, you know, file a complaint with my license. I still love her. I still have love for people. I've just, I just, I have to live that way. And, you know, I might not like certain things about people, but I think, I think people given a chance, even the people that we disagree with the most, we would find that usually if if they're crazy or they have things going on, it's usually from something that's happened to them. And, you know, they're that way for a reason. Whatever their life experience has kind of led them to be that certain way. And I just feel blessed because I've dealt with a lot of that stuff that I've been able to get rid of a lot of that through a lot of work and working things out. And um, I feel really blessed to not have any hatred in my heart and just loving people. So, um, yeah, I love you guys. I do. So, anyways, I'll, I'll stay here if you guys want me to keep talking. Uh, hablo espanol uh, un poquito. Muy un poquito. No. No espanol. No, no hablo espanol. Eh, un poquito. Uh, me gusta tacos. Tacos muy bien. Muy bien. Tacos muy bien. Uh, uh, no, uh, no bebo cerveza. No bebo. Uh, Te quieres. I think that's I love you. Um, gracias. Por... Como se dice watch, watch, el verbo to watch. I, I've taken Spanish, you know, we, we take Spanish in class here, but, um, you know, in high school, I took two years of Spanish, but I think you just hear, especially in California, you know, so my, my grandfather was, <laughs> Tucker says El Wacho, um, my grandfather was a Mexican immigrant, so he, he, he moved up, um, you know, in the agriculture, his mom. So my great grandmother on my maternal side, my grand, so my grandfather's mother uh, ran a boarding house for Mexican immigrants, um, you know, when they're picking fruit in the valleys when they came up. So my grandfather was a Mexican immigrant. And so Mexican culture is really ingrained here in California. And I, you know, I love the culture and it's different. You know, there's, so I think there's, a, and there's a lot of confusion about Mexico. So Mexico, Mexicans, it's changed a lot because now we have a lot of Guatemalans, Central America, Hondurans, 
Um, and it's kind of a different culture. It'd be like us and Canadians, right? We're, we're just different. Um, thank God we're different. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Canadians. I know I got some Canadian viewers. Um, but um, the Mexican culture itself, I've always loved Mexican culture. The food, you guys, if you come to California, you need to eat some authentic Mexican food, like real Mexican food. It's, it's the best food. Um, uh, they're just, they're, they're really into their families. Um, they value hard work. They're really like, um, I mean, uh, anyways, value hard work. They're usually, um, you know, they have spiritual beliefs, very family centered. They do a lot of stuff for their family. And um, I love the Mexican culture, so and I'm part of it. But yeah, California, you know, I, I I'll hear a lot of um, you know maybe uh, you know derogatory comments towards Mexicans and how they drive down prices and everything. And you know, we don't really deal with that up there. We um, I think they're hardworking, honest people, and if they're going to do those jobs for that price, then you know, I, a lot of them are the best installers I've seen. I'm not saying all Mexicans are good tile installers, but there's some really, really good tile installers that I know they're Mexicans. And um, anyways, but I don't speak, I don't speak, uh, again, un poquito hablo espanol. Yeah, Brett, you're going to use uh, Spectralock. Uh, if you're going to use Spectralock 1, um, we've been using it. I think regular Spectralock is better. Um, the shower for bow project that we did in Denver a year ago. See, it's nice for me to, to be able to follow up with installs and see how products are doing out over time because I did some, some testing on uh, Spectralock 1. And, um, you know, how much can I tell with it? you know, within a 30 day period, I just don't know. And I don't know how it's going to hold up over time underwater and, you know, scrubbing whatnot. You just don't know. And I talked to Jason, I go, well, how's the Spectralock one holding up? I'm really curious. And he said, well, it's, 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 it's looking great except for where the shower head hits all the time. So, you know, they got the shower head pointed in one direction and, and if they turn it on, you know, they turn it on and it hits one spot and he said, well, it's kind of wearing away in that spot. I'm like, Oh, uh, that's, that's not good. Um, so jury's still out for me on Spectralock one. We've used it on jobs. Um, but I would go with Spectralock probably. And I'm not huge on Laticrete's colors for whatever reason. I, I don't, um, they don't have as many colors. Like if you look at a custom grout chart, I mean, there's like twice as many colors as the laticrete and then the shades are just I, I don't know like we we always try to match up our tiles to laticrete because we wanted to use the permacolor we wanted to use the spectralock and it just seemed like it was always in between like we're having to choose between two colors where customs and the mape they always just seem like the the grout chart the colors it's like boom man that color is perfect for that tile so i don't know but if you're going to use spectralock i, I think the, the regular Spectralock, besides being, I mean, it's more expensive and you got to mix all the parts together. It's probably a better, better grout than um, the Spectralock one, which there's, they're not, it's not an epoxy. They, they don't admit that they say it has epoxy like performance, whatever that means. So take that for what it is. Yeah, Tucker says, by the way, I'm going to take your advice and hit up one of my local installers and ask if I can shadow them for a, a few days. I want to learn to be faster when floating and other tricks. That's a great idea. Um, you know, it's different now. You know, when we when I was growing up, you know, people were much more guarded with their trade secrets. And I'm sure there, there's still areas where people don't want to teach somebody that might compete with them. But for the most part, if you start networking with other installers, just be like, hey, man, you know, pay me like a helper. I'll come out and, uh, you know, pay me 15, 20 bucks an hour. I'll chop your mud. I'll, I'll make your cuts. I'll mix your grout. I'll mix your thin set, whatever. And 
and mo- I, I would bet people would be thrilled to be able to pass on what they know to you. It's it's just different now. Maybe not the older older guys, but if you know a, a setter who's really good in your area, just be like, hey man, I just want to learn from you. Um, can I be your helper for a couple weeks? I just want to get better at what I do. You know, so um, that that's a great point. I'm glad Tucker. That's awesome. Yeah, go go get better, man. We're all you know. Each of us, even though, because Northern Northern California has a very specific, um, because of our unions in the Bay Area, um, back in the day, back in the, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, the tile work, you know, we learned how to do one coat floats and we had a really specific way. And that is spread across a lot of the Western part of our country, you know, Nevada for sure, Southern California, up towards the Oregon border. And we really had a lot of influence, but even within like, geographical areas where people have very similar install methods usually installers will have learned some little tweaks that make something go better or faster so i always encourage especially if you're learning go out and work for somebody else i mean it's like going to school it's like putting in your time learn those things see other people do them so that you don't have to make those mistakes when you go out Tucker also asked, do you or your guys reuse five gallon buckets or do they clean them out at the end of the day? We always try to save our buckets. I just, I'm not going to say always, you know, we have what we call Friday buckets. Like if it's the end of a long day, you're like, ah, I don't want to clean it. Just, you know, leave it. But um, we usually always keep, keep our buckets. I've shared this before. I remember when I was first installing, I used to stop on the side of the road to um, pick up five gallon buckets. I'd be driving down highway 80 and I'd be like, Oh, five gallon bucket, yep, pull over, run out and get it. And um, I just don't ever forget where I came from, man. I'm, I don't need to do that now, but I don't like to be wasteful. So there's, there's a, um, a product called the beast mixer, which is like a liner for your bucket. And I actually purchased one. I didn't, um, I I think the guy's really cool. Um, Check it out, uh, Beast Mixer, but it's basically a liner. I'll make a video at some point. I just haven't got around to it. I've had it for months, but it's a liner that goes in your bucket and it's made out of rubber. So you do your, you know, mix it up just like you would your regular thin set. At the end of the day, you just, you just stir your mud down and wipe down the sides. And then whatever's left in the bucket, you just take the liner out and pop it out and the plug comes right out. So you're not wasting buckets and you don't have to clean it out. So um, you can use the same bucket forever um, because you have that liner. So I've heard really good things about them and uh, I can't, I can't wait to be trying them out, but that's beast mixer. And again, I didn't, I wasn't like, Hey, send me one of those. I'll try it and make a video. I was just like, man, I want to support you. I paid, I, I don't know how much I paid for it, 170 bucks or something. And he sent it out to me, but I can't wait to, to use it. But yeah, I always try not to waste. I really do. Oh, what's my pick on Spectralock or Fusion Pro? Definitely Spectralock 1. Spe- Spectralock 1 isn't even in the same class as, as Fusion Pro. Fusion Pro is absolute junk in, in a wet area. Do not use it. Do not use Fusion Pro. It's it's basically an acrylic um, has acrylic siliconized acrylic, which is pretty much what the the tube of sanded caulking is. If it gets wet over time, it just starts to fall apart and discolor. Uh, Fusion Pro, I, I don't even think they carry it at Home Depot anymore. It's so many problems with it. So Spectralock One is is definitely on a, another level. Um, I just don't think they've they've mastered like the wear and abrasion of it yet. I know it's hard and it doesn't stain, uh, but where grouts seem to have issues is, is the durability. Like if they get rubbed with a cloth or constant water on them, I think they just, that's, that's in my experience, that's where grouts start to, to fail. Yeah, painters throw away buckets. Um, we do a lot of stucco in California. Uh, the stucco buckets of the color is really good. Um, yeah, you can usually find buckets. 
the Home Depot buckets for the most part aren't very good. They'll they'll break. They'll um, they don't last very long when you you're beating them up with a mixer, but. Yeah, Frank is job starting. They got tech power grout. Have they fixed the problem with it running the colors? It's all the same, Frank. Sorry, man. Tech power grout, customs, um, prism, even Mape Ultra Color. Um, you know, they they just have problems with with um, abrasion when they get wet. I guarantee you if any of you guys went back to your jobs and you used any of those grouts, power grout, ultra color, prism, like shower pan that's wet, take your finger and just rub it and it comes right out. They're all the same. So it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't know what you do about that. You can either not use it or you just tell your customer not to rub it like that. I don't know. It's, it's really, really frustrating. I don't know why the grout manufacturers can't figure this out. It seems like so elementary to me. Like, why would you develop formulas to do that? So I think what happened when they started developing these so these high performance grouts, they were looking for stain resistance, right? They wanted density of the grout, but somewhere along the lines of getting a denser, less porous grout, they sacrificed abrasion resistance. And that's kind of, that's, what I've seen, I don't know what their formulas is and why they change it, but that seems to, to be happening. The old poly blend, as you, if you're an old school setter, you know the poly blend, you know the hydromint grout, the Bostic. Those older type grouts are just so much more durable than the newer ones. Um, but they did have, oh, also the newer high performance grouts are better with, um, uh, they're better with, uh, what do I want to say? Um, color consistency the the old poly blend used to be tough you need to get your water just right the temperatures were finicky and um, otherwise it would effloresce or something so uh, any advice on working with gla glass subway tiles hey glass subway tiles um, I I would recommend don't do anything over a three by six period if it's bigger than a three by six stay the heck away from it they will crack. So yeah, stay away. Maybe a backsplash. I mean, if it was like maybe a three by nine on a backsplash, but every one we've done in a shower, especially an L cut, they crack. So around an outlet, um, cutting around a window, a niche, um, stay away from them. Um, the smaller tiles tend to do better, um, but you get over a three by six, I've seen huge problems and most of them get discontinued uh, yeah, at some point because the manufacturers just get overrun with problems. Uh, I asked about my pay ultra color plus, um, good grout. Uh, in, in my testing, it did slightly better than the other. So I was kind of like trying to pick a winner. I'm like, well, if I got to pick a winner, I'd say Mape Ultra Color Plus, but it's, I mean, it didn't overwhelmingly work better than Prism or Permacolor or, um, you know, any of the other hyper tech power grout. It didn't really like outperform them much, a little bit. You know, we did the abrasion test, but uh, they all seem to be about the same. They're all kind of in the same boat. And that's a great question. So, what do we use in showers? Um, we've been using Spectralock One. And, um, or, or we've been using customs, uh, customs prism prism is nice because it's just so available everywhere. It's at home Depot. It's at Arizona tile, which is right here. And again, the colors are just so nice. So what I'm thinking of doing is going to, um, customs, uh, what's their epoxy Their Um, it used to be hundred percent solids epoxy CEG light. Um, I'd like to really start playing around with that. I think epoxy grout in showers is just a great idea. If, if you're looking for the longest lasting shower, if you want it to last longer than 20 years, I think these other grouts, I think you're going to get 20 years out of them. Um, and it just depends on, depends on, uh, 
what the customer wants and what you're going for. Some people don't care. Some people are like, oh, I'm going to change it out in 15 years anyways. So, um, yeah. Anyways, uh, an hour and 45 minutes of yapping straight. Um, I'm going to start like, I'm going to start um, saying the wrong things. I catch myself on videos sometimes. I'm like, oh, that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> I get the words mixed up. And so, yeah, I'm probably going to start doing that. And I've probably already done this in this video. So uh, thank, thank you for being with me um, again. I love you guys. Um, I love being your tile coach. I love reading your comments and um, so glad to be here with you. Got my silver play button not too long ago, which I'm stoked on. And I uh, just can't wait to see what the future holds for all of us, this whole community as we, um, you know, tile the world, man. Keep it up. Uh, I love hearing uh, again. Share your, uh, my favorite, favorite thing um, to receive is a email from you guys saying that you completed a project. Um, I don't know. That, that keeps me going, man. That's just so cool. So um, everybody, uh, I love you. Um, it's great to see you from all around the world. And um, we'll see you on the next video. Okay, that's right. Peace.